In this video, we'll be going over the best very rare items in D&D, which is the tier just below legendary items and generally balanced for players around levels 11 to 16. And at number 10, we have the Scimitar of Speed. This is a plus two weapon that has the extra effect where you can make one attack with this weapon using your bonus action. Now, normally this effect sounds a lot better on paper than it actually is. A scimitar is only a 1d6 weapon, so it's not very good for most classes, but it does at least count as a finesse and a light weapon, and one of the benefits of a light weapon is the ability to dual wield them. So if you just use your bonus action to do two weapon fighting, you don't really need a high level magic item to allow you to basically do the same thing, only allowing you to add your proficiency bonus to the extra attack. Now, here's where the scimitar of speed shines though. If you're using this on a rogue, and you can use your bonus action in order to attack with this weapon and proc sneak attack like normal. For a rogue, they normally attack only one time per turn anyway, and their sneak attack extra damage can only be applied once per turn. And sneak attack is so much damage that rogues are kind of balanced around getting one sneak attack per turn. And here's where the value of this weapon comes in. You can use your bonus action to proc sneak attack, then use your action to perform the ready action action, which basically states, that you can set a trigger for an action or movement, which once that trigger is met, then you get to use your reaction to do whatever you had readied outside of your turn. Normally, a readied action is used in order to spring an ambush, or to wait until someone comes out of cover in order to attack them, or to pull the rope on a trap or something once people get into position. However, what you can do with your readied action is simply state that you wish to attack with your weapon as soon as it's not your turn anymore. That way, as soon as you end your turn and someone else's turn starts, you get off your second attack with the scimitar, and since it's no longer your turn, you get to activate sneak attack once again. Since one little distinction about sneak attack for rogues is the fact that it is once per turn, but it's not once per round. So if you attack someone outside of your turn, you can just use sneak attack again, no problem. And scimitar speed allows you to do this pretty much every turn by just using your action in order to ready an attack as soon as the next turn starts. Although this does use up your reaction in order to do this, which means no attacks of opportunity, but you honestly don't get a lot of those anyway, and this actually turns scimitar speed into a really high damaging weapon for rogues, which is why it's at the complete bottom of this list, but still makes it over a lot of other really good items since I wanted to have at least one melee weapon on this list. And at number 9, we have Nolzer's Marvelous Pigments. This is an item which contains a couple of paints and a brush, which basically allows whatever you paint to become real, as long as it's only an object. It's kind of like having a 3D printer in D&D, only a magical one. So if you forgot to bring some lockpicks, you can just make some. You can make copies of keys if you have any, if you need some vials, a canteen, a pole, whatever it is you may need, just as long as it's not a magical item or worth more than 25 gold. However, that's not all. It also allows you to draw more ridiculous things, including manipulating the environment if you draw on it. If you're in a dungeon and you draw a door on a wall, it creates an actual real door that will open up into the other room. If you're in a tunnel and you want to make it more brittle so that you can collapse it later, you can just draw cracks into the walls and pillars in order to compromise the foundation. If you want to spy in on another room, you can just draw a little hole or even a window. You can even draw pits so that you can make a pit trap inside a dungeon for someone else, or whenever you might need a big hole, as it even has rules on how the dimensions of these things works, as you can cover up to 100 square feet with 10 minutes of drawing. It also allows you to draw walls, stairs, tunnels, bridges, pulleys, or pits, a ladder. If you have this item, you're kind of set no matter which kind of dungeon you're inside of, or for any number of other scenarios. This item is a real, rewards players who have a great imagination type item, and is pretty generous with rules as written on what you're able to use it with, just as long as you're not trying to create gold coins or something, as if you make anything valuable, the object will look like diamond or a pile of gold, but upon close inspection it looks like paste, bone, or some other worthless material that kind of looks similar. So if you create fake gold and try to use it to buy stuff, the average shopkeeper will be able to easily tell that it's fake. Although I'm sure if you really want to make money with these pigments, there is probably a way to do it, but you are limited in how much paint you have, so there's only so much you can do if you're trying to convert it entirely into gold. And it's best to use a more creative environment, or as a 3D printer in the middle of a dungeon if you forgot something. 
because the average campaign will probably end by the time you use up all your paint, if only used in these kinds of situations. Unless you use it to create gigantic objects all the time, because those do take up a lot of paint. And at number 8, we have the Mirror of Life Trapping. This is a mirror that allows you to trap people inside of it, as long as you're within 30 feet of the mirror, are looking into it, and fail a DC 15 charisma save. And a creature who's trapped inside the mirror can't escape unless they have some way to travel between dimensions. Which means you can kind of permanently trap a whole bunch of creatures in the game. And the mirror even allows you to store up to 12 creatures, as it has 12 separate rooms for storing different creatures. And while they're inside the mirror, they don't need to eat, drink, or sleep, nor do they age, so you can just kind of keep them in there forever. You can also call the name of one of the people trapped in the mirror in order to talk to them, or speak a second command word in order to free them from the mirror. And if you get more than 12 people in the mirror, then we'll spit one of the previous 12 out at random. Now, if a target knows what the mirror does, they do have advantage on the saving throw to not get stuck in it. So as long as the target you're using this on has never met you before, there's a good chance they won't know how the mirror works. The mirror itself basically is a save or die spell. If the enemy target fails to save, you automatically win the encounter if it was the only person in the room. You could use it to steal a big bad boss monster and then just release it inside a volcano later on or into a jail cell in a big city. And as long as you know what the mirror does, if an enemy monster tries to use it on you, you'll have advantage on the saving throw to not get caught in it as well. It's kind of a really powerful item. You could realistically build adventures around the mirror of life trapping, because if the mirror is destroyed, everyone who's stuck in the mirror gets released, and it only has 10 hit points and an AC of 11, so it's pretty easy to destroy actually. It's also 4 feet long and weighs 50 pounds and is vulnerable to bludgeoning damage, so a couple of rocks thrown at the mirror breaks it as well. So it is strong and can completely end boss fights in one move, assuming they don't have legendary resistances, but also you have to lug around a gigantic mirror in order to use it, which does kind of limit its potential a little bit. Sure, it's strong, but it has some pretty glaring vulnerabilities, which is why it's kind of low on this list rather than near the top with all the other really strong items. And at number seven, we have the Helm of Brilliance. This is a helmet full of gems, and based on the kinds of gems you still have left in the helmet, you gain a couple of benefits. One of them is the ability to cast a series of spells by consuming one of the different kinds of gems. Two of the more useful spells you can cast are Fireball and Prismatic Spray. As with Fireball, you can consume one of the Fire Opals in order to use the spell from the helm, which does a crap ton of damage to everything in a 20 foot radius. The helm will have 3d10 Fire Opals, so you can use it a maximum of 30 times assuming you got the full amount. If you use one of the diamonds, you can cast the spell Prismatic Spray, which is a 7th level spell that hits all creatures at a 60 foot cone, and has a random effect on each target based on a 1d8 roll you do. Where, if you roll 1 through 5, it does 10d6 damage to the target of a different type, which is a lot but kind of expected for a 7th level spell. If you roll 6 or 7, you have a chance to petrify or banish the target to another dimension. And if you roll an 8, you get to do two of the effects of the spray to the target. So it has a chance to do 20d6 damage to the target, which is really good on a very rare item. This is why Prismatic Spray consumes one of the diamonds in the helm, and it only has 1d10 diamonds for a maximum of 10 Prismatic Sprays total. Although, outside of casting spells, as long as it has one ruby left, you have resistance to fire damage with it. As long as it has one fire opal, you can light a weapon on fire in order to deal an additional 1d6 fire damage with your attacks, which doesn't consume the gem like casting a spell does. So as long as you just leave one fire opal inside the helm, you'll permanently be able to enchant a weapon with extra fire damage. And as long as it has one diamond left, it basically acts like an undead sensor, where if an undead comes within 30 feet of the helm, it will shed dim light for 30 feet and deal 1d6 radiant damage to any undead who starts its turn in that area. It does have a downside though, where if you're wearing the helmet and fail a saving throw to a spell which deals fire damage, you have to roll a d20, and if you roll a 1, then the helm blows up and shoots laser beams at everyone. Now this is only a 5% chance to happen, and only on spell damage, so you don't have to worry about using this from a dragon's fire breath or something, since that's technically not a spell. So it's almost just there for flavor, and not an actual detriment. Everything else about the helm is really good, especially the high level spells that it can cast, and the multiple free fireballs you get from it. And at number 6, we have the Staff of Power. 
This is a staff with 20 charges that allows you to spend those charges in order to cast a whole bunch of different spells. Some of the highlights including, if you spend 5 charges, you can cast a 5th level version of Fireball or Lightning Bolt, which are two pretty heavy hitting damaging moves. You can also cast Hold Monster or Wall of Force, which are incredible good crowd control abilities, or for a single charge you can cast Magic Missile, and a whole bunch of other actually useful spells. In addition to this, it has a passive benefit of giving you plus 2 to your AC, your saving throws, and all of your spell attack rolls. Getting a plus 2 to your AC is really good for a non-armor piece of equipment, and that's just a bonus on top of all the others, including the plus 2 to your saving throws, which is also really good to have on top of everything else. And remember, death saving throws count as a saving throw, so you get a plus 2 to that as well. It also has the benefits if you use it as a melee weapon, where it's counted as a plus two quarterstaff, and allows you to spend charges in order to deal extra force damage when you hit with it. But one of the more powerful uses of the staff is what happens if you break it over your knee. You see, this staff has an ability called Retributive Strike, where if you break the staff, it explodes and deals damage based on the number of charges still left in the staff. If you're within 10 feet of the creature and it has all 20 charges, that's 160 force damage on a failed dexterity save or half as much on a success. And it's less and less damage the further are you away from the point of impact, and the person who breaks the staff has a 50% chance to travel to another plane in order to avoid the explosion. Otherwise, they take 16 times the damage and will probably die. It is kind of a do or die thing, but being able to deal 160 damage to a final boss of a campaign with one item is actually really good. Even if they succeed the save, that's still 80 points of damage which is a big chunk, but not really worth killing yourself over if you fail the d100 roll. There is a stronger version of this called the Staff of the Magi, which has 50 charges, so it has the potential to deal 400 damage. Although that's a legendary item, at the very rare item level, 160 damage is still a lot, and that's just an option you can use on top of all the other really good things that the Staff does. Remember, one of the great things about items that let you cast spells is that it allows you to cast non-cantrip spells with your action if you use a spell as a bonus action during your turn. It also provides some really nice passive benefits while allowing you to cast some pretty good free spells, and it doesn't have a limited amount of times you can use the spells like the Helm does, which is why it slightly beats out the Helm of Brilliance. Even though the Helm of Brilliance can technically cast the better spell of Prismatic Spray, because it's technically limited in how many times it can use it total, whereas the staff regains some of its charges every day while also just providing better passive benefits in the helm as well. And at number 5, we have the Illusionist Bracers. Now, these bracers are from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, and have the effect that if you cast a cantrip, you can use a bonus action in order to cast that cantrip a second time. So basically, it's an item that allows you to cast two cantrips in a turn, which is actually really good on certain classes that love their cantrips, namely Warlocks that build fully into their Eldritch Blast. Eldritch Blast is a cantrip that Warlocks have, which they can increase the damage of with one of their invocations that allows them to add their spellcasting modifier to the damage of all their Eldritch Blast bolts. And normally, Warlocks don't have the option to cast a spell with their bonus action, but if they're able to do it with the Illusionist Bracers, they get a lot more benefits than pretty much all the other spellcasters if they choose invocations that buff their Eldritch Blasts. Even for non-warlocks, being able to cast two cantrips every turn that you're not using your leveled spells is just extra damage during the turn that you do choose to use cantrips, as not every encounter really needs one of your big fireball spells. So it may not buff your big damage, unless you're a warlock, but it does buff your average damage by quite a bit, which makes Illusionist Bracers pretty strong, and definitely one of the better very rare items in the game. And at number 4, we have the Bronze Horn of Valhalla. This is an item that has a different effect depending on which rarity you use, and the Bronze version of this has the ability that, if a person who blows this horn has proficiency with all medium armor, then they can summon 4d4 plus 4 Berserkers once every 7 days. These Berserkers last for 1 hour and will help you in combat, and the Berserkers themselves are CR2 creatures with actually pretty big health pulls for that low CR, at around 70 on average. Which means, even if you summon these in tier 3 levels of play, like what very rare items are made for, it's reasonable to expect the Berserkers to easily survive a couple of AoEs done by the enemy. As it's not until tier 4 levels of attacks that you have Ancient Red Dragon's Fire Breaths being able to one-shot a group of Berserkers. And the Berserkers themselves only have one Great Axe attack, which deals around 9 damage on average, 
and the horn can summon around 12 berserkers on average. So if all 12 of those berserkers hit during their turn, which is very possible since they all have recklessness and can give themselves advantage on their attack rolls, that's around 110 damage from one item during one round. There's a reason this item has a 7 day cooldown. Being able to summon this many beefy creatures at once is big. Although, it can also kind of be cumbersome to control all the berserkers, in which case I'd recommend looking into mob combat rules, that way you can run all the berserkers without having to roll 12 dice rolls for all their attacks. Pretty much all rarities of the Horn of Valhalla have made it into my top 10 items list, but that's because summoning a whole bunch of big beefy monsters is just kinda good, even if you can only do it once every 7 days. And at number 3, we have the Peregrine Mask. This is another item from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, just like the Illusionist Bracers, and while you're attuned to this helmet, you gain a fly speed of 60 feet and have advantage on your initiation rolls. Now, this is another very simple effect. It's just two little things. A fly speed and advantage on one roll. However, fly speed is really good. Items like the Boots of Flying are commonly used alongside legendary items in tier 4 levels of play. That's like around level 20 adventurers. Because obtaining fly speed in D&D is just ridiculously good. There's a reason the Arakoa race is just banned in Adventures League, because that race gets a fly speed baseline, which is too strong for a lot of pre-written adventures. And Boots of Flying have a limited duration on how much fly speed they can give you, whereas the Mask just permanently gives you a fly speed at all times. And it's a pretty good one too at 60 feet. It's basically on this list just for the fly speed. But the advantage on initiation rolls is also good too. Although, if I were to rank their usefulness, the fly speed on this would get a 10 out of 10, whereas the initiation would get something like a 5 out of 10. Still useful, but nowhere near as useful as flying. Although, still a nice benefit to get on top of the flying speed. And at number 2, we have the Belt of Fire Giant Strength. This is a belt that simply sets your strength score to 25 while you're attuned to it. The maximum a character can get their strength score to normally, outside of capstone abilities, is 20. So, having this item on you literally makes you stronger than your character can get on its own. Which is pretty good, although I don't think I really need to explain this one very much. Generally, being able to increase your best stat to 20 is what you want to prioritize during leveling your character. Although, for the Belt of Giant Strength, you can just kind of ignore that, because you're not going to get it higher than 25. And there are other rarities of this belt as well, with the best legendary variant giving you 29 strength. So there is the option to increase your strength even more later on, but only through getting a better version of this belt. Now it might not be as fancy as some of the other items on this list, like the Helm of Brilliance or the Staff of Power, but the pure stats of this belt are just statistically better in most cases. You can't really beat just increasing your stat above its maximum. And at number one, we have the Manuals and Tomes of Stats. There are a series of items in the game which I'll show on screen, which all basically have the same effect where, if you spend 48 hours over a period of 6 days reading the book and practicing its teachings, you get to increase one of your main stats by 2, which also increases the maximum for that score. And once you gain this benefit, the manual will lose its magic, but will be usable again after 1 century. So basically it functions as a limited item that allows you to boost one of your stats by plus 2. Although the fact that it also allows you to go above the maximum of 20 is kind of big. And another distinction to this item, there is no limit on how many times you can do this. So, if you're in an incredibly magic-heavy campaign, and are able to get multiple copies of the Manual of Quickness of Action, for example, you can essentially infinitely increase your dexterity score by plus two. Although, if you have a good DM, they'll quickly find a way to limit your access to these manuals, because that's kind of broken in unlimited amounts. And most games will never come across a single one of these manuals or tomes. But if you have the option to pick any very rare item, these books are statistically some of the best things you can pick up, as you can't really beat a permanent increase to your character's abilities, which doesn't use any of your attunement slots, which is why the manuals and tomes that increase your stats easily takes number one spot on this list. And if you were to pick the best one of them, it would probably have to be the Manual of Quickness of Action, purely because Dexterity is the best attribute in the game. Although the best one is literally just whatever your class likes the best which changes depending on what class you're playing, obviously. Alright, and that's the video. If you think there's any other better, very rare items in the game that should have been in this video, or have ideas for future videos just like this one, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments. And also, did you know 
only around 40% of people who actually watch these videos are subscribed to the channel.